Well, I never thought as a growing man that I would ever get the chance to do this, but I'm here with former CEO of the South Sydney Rabbitohs, um, Mr. Series 500 Speedway Series, Sidecar Grand Slam, Closet Ice Hockey Nuts. Um, I could go on forever, but uh, David Tapp, I cannot believe this is happening. Well, I'm really, really happy to join you. I've, I've seen some of your content online and I commend you on the job that you're doing. And, you know, I like to uh, encourage, embrace, support anyone that's having a red hot go. So well done to you and I'm happy to be here. You've left me speechless, which is a pretty uh, mean feat. But I'll put it this way. My first memory of you ever would have either been commentating motorsport on Channel 9 when I was a very little boy or at the Brisbane Exhibition Ground watching you bring over all the overseas riders. Yeah, well, you're talking uh, in the case of the Exhibition Ground and the um, International Master Series or the Series 500, as, as people like to call it. Uh, that was in 1995, so 27 years ago. Uh, and the motorsport commentary on Channel 9 would have been about 92 that would have started. So you would have been a small boy, I guess. So at this point, that makes you at least 35, but you've had a career longer than most people's arms. So I already know most of these answers from doing a bit of research today, but you weren't someone to ride the coattails of your father. So let people know um, the tap last name and how that correlates to uh, being a broadcaster. Yeah, well, for when I left school, uh, I deliberately went in a completely different direction into retailing and marketing. I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder, uh, which in hindsight was silly, but uh, I didn't ever want anyone to say uh, that you're only here because your dad got you here or, or you know, something of that nature. And I was determined to make it on my own. So I actually had a, a really good career uh, in retailing. But to be quite honest with you, it was always in my, the pit of my stomach that I wanted to be a broadcaster. And um, a couple of my friends actually said to me one day, mate, what are you doing? You, you should be doing that. And don't worry about the, the parallels or comparisons or, or what the narcs say. In the end, you're going to survive on your own ability. I guess I needed to hear that. And um, it happened, you know, uh, and I rang my dad and I said, I was still only in my, I think I was about 24. So I wasn't that old. And uh, I rang him and said, I've made a decision. I want to follow in your footsteps, but I'm not going to call horse racing because that's like trying to be Elvis Presley's son and sing. <laughs> uh, you're on a hiding of nothing. So I'll go in a different direction. I was already very passionate about Speedway. Uh, I'd already been racing sedans about three years by that time. And uh, he said, mate, I knew this call would come. I wish you all the best. I'm not making a phone call for you. And I said, perfect. That's how it has to be. And um, uh, yeah, I was able to get a, a start um, as motorsport editor. At a, at a Sydney radio station where I primarily did phone interviews uh, a few times a week. I used to do a segment every Saturday morning and preview the weekend in motorsport around the world, F1, IndyCar, MotoGP, Speedway, whatever. And it, it just began from there. And after about six months, um, the sports director of that radio station invited me in to, to do in-host uh, you know, studio uh, segments rather than on the phone. And it just grew from there. It, it really exploded. And it wasn't long before I had more work than I could Ever, ever dream of. I came across you many, many times in my life already with uh, what you've done and what you continue to do. But also a good friend of mine is a mutual friend and that's Paul Coke Cohen. And uh, he has nothing but raps on you. And there's so many people that say uh, a Speedway, let alone motorsport, is never going to see another David Tatt. Uh, that's nice, but um, I, I hope that someone does come along uh, and, and do try and emulate what I was lucky to be involved in and achieve in the sport. But uh, as for Paul Cohen, one of my best mates, to be honest with you, and, and he can relate to everything because I remember taking the International Master Series to Townsville uh, in 1997 for the first time. So the series had already been conducted two years prior and it was time for it to grow. It was very successful. And that particular year, we went to Mount Gambia for the first time in South Australia, Rockhampton and Townsville. And it was very risky because, uh, you know, Townsville was a, a well-known hotspot for, you know, for inclement weather in January, you know, rain season and, and all of that. So it was very risky. 
And um, I flew up a number of times before the event to, to make sure things were in place with publicity and advertising. And, and, and Coke came out of the Speedway. Uh, it wasn't during a meeting. It was like on a Wednesday or something, uh, maybe six months before. And uh, introduced himself. And um, he, he said, mate, oh, what you were doing is amazing. You're bringing the best guys in the world to our town. I want to help you. And, and he actually was instrumental in, in getting, I don't know, maybe 30 grand's worth of sponsorship. Um, on top of the sponsors that I already had. And, uh, mate, I just love the guy. Um, he, he just is a real goer, you know, like yourself. And um, and he just helped every year thereafter. Uh, we were lucky it didn't rain that time. And, and in fact, it never rained any time we went to Townsend. So we were fortunate. And, um, yeah, he's he, he can relate to the struggles because he, he knew what I was going through. It wasn't easy. Uh, I was very busy in media at the time. I was calling NRL Rugby League. Uh, I was hosting radio shows. I had uh, the Checkered Flag program on there, which ran on Fox Sports for 20 years, Speedway Show. And here I am gallivanting around the country as well, uh, trying to put, put this event on. And it was not easy, mate. It cost a lot of money. And uh, if it were not for people like him helping and our ability as an organisation in sourcing sponsorship, never would have happened. And... Um, also, the battles with the, the sports peak body at the time, both both national and state, um, you know, motorcycling Australia and, and I think it's called MQ Motorcycling Queensland at the time, made all they did was put brick walls up. They couldn't have made life any harder instead of helping. And he saw all that. So I, I guess we just had a little bit of a bond from there. You've attracted so many people or you've been drawn to so many people that are so famous across the world and you've, you've hung in there with the best you know, like Daryl Eastlake and heaps of huge names. Another story I heard too is you took on a rugby league call on zero notice. It was one of the hugest games of the season and you just did it. Like, you're yeah. not a normal person. Uh -huh. That was 1992 and uh, I, I wanted to call rugby league badly. Uh, you know, before it had always been my favourite sport. I'd always been a Rabbitoh supporter. And um, back then, there were about four radio stations in Sydney covering the game. Now there's only two, one on the FM band and one on AM. And um, so um, the program director came to me on Friday afternoon. So it was only two days before the grand final, which was on Sunday. I didn't call first grade. I called the second grade. Didn't matter to me. I didn't care what it was. And uh, yeah, he said, um, you've been talking to me, Tappy, for about six months, aspiring to call football. I was doing some around the grounds reporting. So I was in the mix, but I wasn't a head caller yet. And um, he said, oh, I need someone to do this game on Sunday. Can you do it? I said, absolutely. You know, so that's what happened. And of course, I didn't know any of the players because they were lower grade players. It was a massive challenge, but it, it, it came off really well. That's a, a broadcaster or commentator's nightmare. Like, I've done it on the smallest scale ever, nothing compared to what you have, but you get a run sheet and you go, oh no, I'm in, I'm in it here, I'm really bad, but you just do it and you get on with it. But you've, you've heard a, a few cool little tips from some big names on how to cope with not knowing the names of people. What are some of those? Yeah, there's been a lot. Um, the legendary Ray Warren, perhaps as he's affectionately known, the voice of the game for a very long time. The radio station, that I alluded to earlier, where, where it all began for me and where I called the first game. He was also there, but not calling rugby league. He was hosting the drive time uh, sports program Monday to Friday because he was calling with nine on weekends. And he taught me a lot about uh, breathing, inflections. Don't call from your throat, call from your chest. That way, when something exciting happens, you've got room to go up. He said, if you're already up in your throat, you're going to explode. There's nowhere to go. Um, and, uh, and he said, mate, when someone's got the ball and you don't know who it is, that's when you tell the score. Or you say they're 15 metres in from the eastern touch line, 10, 10 metres on you know, their own side or halfway. And I'm telling you, all broadcasters do it. You cannot possibly tell in that game who's got the ball all the time, uh, particularly on a rainy, muddy day when their jersey and their face is muddied up. And So you've got to just be um, um, ready to drop those things in, which it's very legitimate. It's you know, valuable information. We're talking about radio here, so they can't see it. So uh, if you say, you know, nine minutes to go in the first half and they're 15 in from the Eastern Touchline and the score's 12 all, that's information that's quite normal. But what the listener doesn't know is you probably didn't know who was carrying the ball at that time. Yeah. TV, different thing. Um, because they can see it. 
So there's actually less pressure on you to describe everything, but you still do tend to throw in, uh, you know, uh, you might do something like uh, these two sides uh, in action at the present time. Next week, one of them plays the Roosters and the other. You, you find a way of battling through it without giving yourself up. So there you go. Now, through this, where I'm finding it hard to even want to talk. I just want to sit back and listen to you talk the whole time. But I'm, I'm taking the challenge. But throughout this, I can't stand structure to do what I want to do. I want to talk about everything left, right and centre. So I'm a bit of a bouncy ball at the moment. But how did you come up with the Speedway sidecar Grand Slam? Because that's never been replicated. Towards the end of the International Masters Series, uh, which ran between 95 and, uh, and 2001, um, around 19, late 1998, I, I, I was looking at sidecars closely because we used to have them as a support act uh, to the Masters Series nine times out of ten. How could you not be a fan of sidecar racing? I've been a fan of it since I was, I was a little boy going to Liverpool and, and the Sydney showground. What those guys do is unbelievable. And it really, it's the best kept secret in world sport, <laughs> speedway sidecar racing. It's the most gladiatorial thing you can ever see. And, and talk about bravery. It's unprecedented. Uh, so given that we were carting a lot of good sidecar guys around the country with the solo series, it just occurred to me, hang on, you should be doing something for the, something for the sidecars too. But of course, it couldn't clash with the, the Masters series. So... In 1999, I ran a thing called the Clean Team Radiator Coolant Sidecar Super Pre. Um, and we did six or seven rounds in November, which gave me time then to focus on the solos after that. And it went all right. I mean, it was moderately successful and uh, featured all, all the guns. Uh, in that area, you had blokes like Andrew Cleave and obviously the O'Brien and you know all of them. And um, it went okay. So when I was done and dusted with the the solos or the, the master series um i still promoted the odd event got involved in different things uh still very passionate and uh great friends with dave parker who was the general manager of gilman speedway at the time which is the best bike speedway in the country bar none and uh he's a real sidecar fan having been a sidecar racer himself and we just got our heads together one day over a, a bundy rum <laughs> and um and thought, why not do something on a larger scale? So the sidecar Grand Slam was effectively born then, and and it was it was pretty successful. It it drew really good crowds, and to be quite honest with you, the solo scene was not strong at the time. So if you were going to play bike promoter on a national basis, the sidecars were really the only option. And there was a lot of depth. Their bikes had come such a long way. Their presentation was far superior than it had been, even in 1999, and. Um, it just worked. And um, that was a, a joint venture between Dave Parker and I. And we we're a great team. You know, he was super passionate and uh, I was super busy in, in all the other things I was doing. If he wasn't involved, I wouldn't have done it because I couldn't do it on my own. And uh, we shared the workload perfectly and it, it worked okay. And it really only ended when I decided to pull a pin on, on my involvement in Speedway. With all that, You've, you've covered so much already just on that one topic, but I took a long break from Speedway, bikes and sidecars. And when I come back, the first thing I said is, cool, right, I'm ready to book flights. Let's go to the Grand Slams. And everyone said, no, nah, Tuppy's out. And that was probably something that broke my heart a lot. And I want people to understand, though, when you said you're busy, your definition of busy is not the normal human being definition. Just let people in on what, Tappy's version of busy actually is? Oh, well, I mean, at, at the time, yeah, I, I was a bit of a maniac, I must admit. Um, worked a lot of hours and, and seven days a week. For, for nine years, in fact, I worked seven days a week for nine years you know, in, in media and um, still found time to play Speedway. <laughs> um, but the reality is we had a television production company which was going extremely well. Speedway probably represented 25% of that. We were doing rugby league, ice hockey, basketball, uh, touch football, Oztag, road racing, motorsport, uh, wheelchair rugby, um, uh, and softball, baseball. Um, it was all happening. I was still broadcasting rugby league for Fox um, and, and doing other media activities. 
uh, the, the TV production business was growing rapidly. Uh, we were punching out five, six programs a week at that time in all different sporting genres. We had the publishing company with Speedway Racing News Magazine, which I had for 18 years. Um, plus, I'm a family man and all the rest of it. So, yeah, it was insane. Totally insane. Um, but I loved every minute of it. How crazy is that? Yeah. Uh, what I'm getting from you already is you're someone with a lot of energy and a lot of drive. And I think that's a very crucial thing to what you were doing. But also the drive sort of manifests everything. So whether it be, you know, I've got the drive, but I've got to do this, this and this, you just get it done. So do you understand the term give up? Does that register to you at all? No, no chance. Um, if, if it's, if it's a, a passion and it's possible and it's not going to bankrupt you, uh, no chance is give up an option. <laughs> no way. If I had that mentality in any way, even if that was 5% of me, the, the International Masters Series never would have happened. That was a massive undertaking. People, people just don't know what was involved in that. The, the, the money that had to be found, the money that had to be paid to these guys, you know, Ricardson, Umalenko, Wig, um, you know, all these guys that were earning huge money in Europe, the logistics, um, the television coverage alone, carting production around Australia. And like, it was just huge. And let me tell you, a lot of people, including some of my best mates, said, mate, you're dreaming. This isn't going to happen. When someone says that to me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Watch it. You know, so, but mate, it did take its toll. That was really hard work and very stressful on top of everything else that I've just explained. But um, had some good people around me. Obviously, you can't do it all on your own. But give up, no chance. I mean, you know, if, if you quit on something that has already been successful and you've driven it for a long time, and if you quit on it because... Either A, you don't have the passion anymore and you want to do something else, or B, it's heading to a financial disaster because of circumstances out of your control. That's not quitting. That's smart. You know, Speedway Racing News Magazine, Speedway Racing News Magazine, rather, I had it for 18 years and it was around, I bought it in 1998. I think it was, it was inaugurated in 1975. So it was around a long time. In the end, I had to close it. It was just a financial basket case in the end. Because, you know, the World Wide Web has done a lot of damage to publishing. So I don't consider that a failure. It's not a failure for Renner successfully for, you know, say 16 of the 18 years. In the end, it was the right decision. But, but in the main, no, you're not allowed to quit. That's just not on. You've raised a lot of points here and um, you did explain it perfectly. Now, yes, you're a salesman, but for a purpose, but you've been totally transparent there. People don't understand. They just want, in my experience, they just want someone to hand over fist, do everything with money and everything like that until they got nothing left to give and then it's over and then they go, okay, well, we'll move on to the next guy that's going to do it. Unfortunately, is there is no next David Tap, which is a phrase we're going to use a lot here. There is no David Tap anymore in Speedway, just left a hole. But... I've found too that your want to be creative hasn't stopped. So you've done something that's actually really scary and that's to do audible singing to give your own lyrics and everything that people can actually understand. And you've opened up your feelings to the world and done it in a great way. Yeah. And it happened, uh, it coincided with uh, my exit from Speedway because I had a little bit of more time on my hands all of a sudden. The Speedway, as I've just explained, occupied a lot of time in one form or another. And uh, I'd been tinkering away on guitar for, you know, a while and, uh, you know, just playing in the bedroom and thinking, uh, thinking not going all right, but truth is I wasn't very good. And I went into a competition, uh, a bit like The Voice, um, and um, got put into a band with four people I didn't even know. And it went, it went well and we went in this competition, we won it. Uh, then that band broke up, <laughs> as bands do, because we couldn't agree on song choice and things of that nature. Uh, so I just started my own band uh, called Midlife Crisis, uh, which is a great name. Just a whole bunch of old guys doing their best, you know. And uh, it just flew. You know, we were doing an incredible amount of gigs. And, of course, uh, primarily a covers band, Aussie Anthems and, and all, the, all the pub rock that people love. And, uh, yeah, I just decided uh, about 18 months ago to, to write a song, see if I could do it, and, uh, you know, compose the music, produce it and all that with 
with the help of my brother-in-law, who's an outstanding um, uh, record producer and, and engineer. And uh, yeah, so look, it was released and um, it was not for any particular reason other than me, just another challenge. That's all. I, I don't care if anyone ever downloads it. It was just just uh, an original song I did and uh, I was really proud of how it turned out. You should be proud of it because um, I've been in bands, I've sung in death metal bands and you can hide because no one can understand what you're saying. But as soon as you get to clean sing, that's when it's scary. That's worse than standing on top of a building because then you've got to, your feelings come out and people criticise. So you've done something that's very, very scary. Yeah, it, it was scary in the beginning, uh, of course. And, and certainly with the band, um, there was always this thing, is anyone going to turn up and watch us? <laughs> you know, uh, when you start out. like, And of course, plenty of times no one turned up. In fact, we did a gig one night at a pub in Western Sydney where we sung for the security guards and the bar staff. That's it. <laughs> But I, you know, I'm positive. I said to God, "Come on, we're getting paid. Let's have a rehearsal." And but as time went on and we became known, we we had a fantastic following, particularly on the northern beaches in Sydney. But unfortunately, COVID has you know largely destroyed it. Um, but I, you know, I'm lucky. I have a music studio a studio at home where I'm talking to you from now, so I, I still get to play every day, and uh, we'll get back on the road soon. But um, yeah, it's all fun. It's um, it wouldn't have been possible had I still been playing speedway. Because obviously, uh, when I got out of that, Saturday nights became available, at least in the summer, if I didn't have rugby league moves in the winter. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's been really good for me. It's uh, given me a bit of a balance in life because pretty much for 30 years, all I did was work. So I want to explain something to the people what who will watch this. You don't have COVID or anything like that. I suffer from the same thing as you. I have allergies. And as soon as there's a slight bit of wind, dust or anything like that, I sniffle and sneeze a million times, but it's funny. I still go to Speedway. <laughs> How funny. Maybe that's why I got allergies 30 years going to the Speedway. Yeah. But uh, no, it's not, it's not too bad. It's better than it was. Uh, about 18 months ago, I was really struggling with it actually. And it, and it became a problem even with what I ate and drank. I couldn't drink beer. I couldn't drink wine because I became allergic to brewer's yeast. But as my doctor said, mate, you've given it a red hot go. Just go off it for a while. Uh, and even food, anything with excess preservatives or baker's yeast, yeah, but that's much better now. So just get the odd hay fever symptom now. I notice you're looking ridiculously skinny and fit. You're never a fat guy, but you look <laughs> out, of, out of control at the moment. It's actually making you want to turn my video off. <laughs> oh, stop it. Stop it, mate. You, you look athletic and, and uh, you know, uh, I'm sure you'd get a role in a superhero movie anytime you want, but well, thanks for that, but um, I actually have put a few kilos on during all the lockdown period, but yeah, thank you. What else can I say? I wanted... I'm grateful for your comments. I'll uh, send me an invoice and I'll pay it. <laughs> Just send a rubber check and it'll be fine. Um, uh -huh. I want to touch on the logistics and I don't want to know down to the dollar costs or whatever, but... I heard about um, what it cost to run a rugby league team when you were the CEO of the Rabbitohs, but getting back to the Speedway thing, back in those 90s, that would have been huge amounts of money back then to try and put on that international series. Oh, absolutely. Um, it was about half a million dollars a season had to be found to stage that event at a break-even level. Um, and that was a thought that was worth, that'd be a million now, wouldn't it? And... Um, don't forget, that was pre the, the, the uh, budget airlines. So we were paying through the nose with uh, the likes of Qantas and Anstead. I think back then it was like $800 returned to go to Adelaide. Uh, the cost of bringing guys from the other side of the world, we used to have uh, eight to 10 overseas riders every year. And uh, there's the freight. I had to bring all their bikes in and, and their spares and their tires and um, the, the advertising costs, producing TV commercials. And we had a souvenir magazine. And, uh, the accommodation cost an absolute fortune. There was no IBIS and, and budget hotels around then. So um, you could actually do it cheaper now, given the way the world has, has, has changed. But it was a huge amount of money. And, you know, those riders, you, during that era, the sport was going really well still in England, um, which it isn't now. Um, it was on its knees in Australia, which is exactly why we did what we did. Um, but, you know... Um, they were not. They didn't hold back with their asking price. <laughs> if you want the good guys, and you're saying, you know, leave your family for six weeks at Christmas time, you've got to make it worth their while. So it wasn't easy. And 
Obviously, the venues contributed. If they wanted to have a round, they had to pay X, Y, Z towards it. And it was a great, great thing for them because we did all the work. Made the TV ads, made the radio ads, did the print media advertising, did all the PR, organised the press days, organised the launches, organised the dinners, um, turned up with all the riders, all the bikes. We paid the accommodation, all the cost. So really, the, the venues opened the gates and reaped the rewards. Uh, and that was fine because that was good for the sport. If the promoters are making it good, that's, that's a really good thing. They're not now, any of them. <laughs> um, made with the exception of John and Kathy at Archfield. Um, yeah, so uh, it, was a, it was a tough deal. So with what the tracks contributed, and I've never ever talked about this before, to be honest, I still had to find a couple of hundred grand uh, with sponsors uh, every, every year. That was a lot of money, you know, and uh, very fortunate I was able to attract some great brands, you know, Century Batteries, um, uh, Tire Power, um, obviously Series 500 were the principal sponsor for five years and Skilled Engineering became the, the principal sponsor after that. But we had, we had more sponsors than Australian Speedway had ever seen before. And I'm really proud of that. We, I mean, we really did. And um, we sort of changed things up in as much as if I signed Simon Wheat to come and do the tour, which I did, you had to have him, right? The deal I did with him was that I owned the four covers on his bike. So Simon Wig would ride the Century Batteries Jower, my sponsor, you know what I mean? It was the only way I could make it work. And the sponsors would uh, be given corporate tickets and we'd feed them properly. We had outstanding launches, publicity, and there was no one else doing that in Speedway. And I knew how to do that by virtue of seeing all the other sports that I've been involved in. You know, so we, we changed things up a lot in that regard. And sadly, it's all gone backwards. Totally gone backwards. You know, we had TV coverage in 42 countries. You know, that... That's never happened with any any event in Australian Speedway. He can see Sutton Sam, and now Ermolenko winds up the horsepower. He slides it up for an outside slingshot. A beautiful pass here. Marvellous pitches, great sport here. Congratulations to Ermolenko. You'd swear he'd won the world final again. Look at this jubilation down trackside. But there he is, 24 years of age, and he's certainly jubilant. I think this is a big credit to Speedway. And I tell you what, the world has been focused on this series. All around the world, everybody's been calling, keeping tabs on what's going on. And guess what? You guys got to see it, man. That's hot. And the winner of the 13th round half million dollar inaugural series 500 International Speedway Challenge, the world champ, Tony Rickardson. past but um i just want to say this straight up is um they were some of the greatest times of my life and i'm only a 37 year old man like i still remember that like it was yesterday and every time i go to the speedway wherever i go now to do anything we still talk about it now and how long ago was that now be 30 years or something well um, it started in 95 i mean you you were probably at the brisbane exhibition ground uh, in February 95 for the series grand final, which was the 25th of February uh, that year. And uh, we actually ran a, an event there a month before too. So the Echo used to traditionally hold, hold two rounds, uh, but it was the place to have the grand final. It was just a magical arena. And being in the middle of the, of the, of the venue, whether it was introducing the riders at the start of the night or, or calling the races, mate, it was like being the circus ringmaster and you could hear the crowd. Like if, if someone swept around the outside, it was goosebump stuff. It was just a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. And the only venue in Australia that comes close to that is the Royal Adelaide Showground, Wayville, where we used to get massive crowds, standing room only. And uh, it was a similar feel. You know, um, it sounded like there were 100,000 people in it. Sounded like <laughs> there, there were not 100,000 people, there, but the noise was deafening. Uh, the second year we went with the series, Ryan Sullivan, the Adelaide local, beat Simon Wig on the last corner. And there was about 12,000 people there. 
and mate, the, the noise was deaf. It was just one of the great nights of my life. I'm so glad that you have fond memories of that. And, you know, I've had it said to me, the only thing you get from looking back at the past is a sore neck, but it's very important to document these things because one day you and me both won't be here. And, you know, I would hate that it to be a distant memory that no one thinks about. But Simon Wigg particularly, he's not here anymore, but I will never, ever forget him going around the Ecker. Uh, Billy Hamill, Hancock, you name it, Rooney Halter. He was a huge favourite for me. Um, you did that. Well, my favourite memory, sorry, my, my favourite memory from the from the Echo with that series is the grand finale of that, that first season I was just talking about when Sam Ermolenko went around the outside, his right knee was scraping on the wall to beat Simon Wigg on the last corner. Um, Rick Hardson came third. He won the series the first year. Uh, and he'd obviously been the most consistent, but he did that night. It was all about an Link Khan week. Um, you know, they they were the superstars of the grand finale. But of course, Ricardson uh, was the overall champion. But I'll never forget that. And that was one of those nights. The sound, the, the, the it was like a coliseum. The, the crowd went nuts. You talked about looking back. You know, I don't look back about. I don't think about that stuff very much now. I'm only doing it now because you're asking me questions. If I told you, I do not have one. Scary of memorabilia. I have not one item of anything from the six years we ran out across Australia. I don't have a poster. I don't have a T-shirt. I don't have a cap. I don't have a program. Uh, all I've got is some VHS tapes of the TV shows, which I haven't watched for 10 years. I've got nothing <laughs> uh, to, uh, to look back on or, you know, to commemorate that period. Can you believe that? I'm not lying. I haven't got anything. Isn't that crazy? Because there's people yeah. that... Um will have a tear off of someone from that era sitting in their man cave with filth all over it, but they know exactly who it is. But <clears throat> I don't just want to cover Speedway. This is my year of branching out, I guess you'd say. But rugby league, there's not one Australian kid that has never watched rugby league. And I was a massive Broncos fan growing up because we had the probably one of the best Broncos eras when I was a little boy. But your team was South Sydney and you went through a lot when you were involved with South Sydney um, because of the Super League thing, I think it was. Can you explain to the people home what that was all about? Well, the, the Super League thing uh, made an impact in as much as the whole thing was ridiculous and cost both sides, if you like, I think about a billion dollars they lost. Uh, and they were propped up by media organisations who were desperately trying to um, keep the rights or acquire the rights. Optus Vision, which was uh, one of the three new pay TV subscription services that started in 1995, uh, had legitimately won the rights to broadcast rugby league. And um, um, the uh, organisation at the helm of Foxtel didn't like that. So they decided to start their own competition. That's how it started. Um, and when they put the game back together um, in 98, I think it was, because the whole Super League ARL thing only lasted one season. It was an unmitigated disaster. Um, they then started going on about criteria because, of course, there were too many teams there because there were Super League teams in the mix and putting the game back together. There wasn't enough money to feed them all because the governing bodies pay the salary cap grants to the clubs. Uh, and unfortunately, South Sydney, a couple of years later, became a casualty of that unbridled rubbish, which is all it was, uh, and were thrown out of the competition. Uh, totally wrong. One of the most sickening acts of corporate greed I've ever seen in my life. And um, the club had been the most successful in the history of the game, always paid its bills, produced the most international players that, that wore the green and gold, uh, and back then had won 20 premierships, blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, as it turns out, there were a lot of high-profile people that didn't accept it, got together and, uh, and challenged in the, in the Supreme Court. And uh, history now shows the club won an appeal uh, based on, I think it was Section 47 of the Trade Practices Act, that, and, and they therefore were reinstated the game. Um, that's when I, I'd always been a fan and I'd been on the peripheral as a, as a broadcaster. Um, but when they got back in the competition, the club had no money. It hadn't existed for two years. To run an NRL team even then was a $15 million a year exercise. I'm talking 2001, I think it was. 
And um, so I, I got involved to help them get dollars. Uh, I was on this group, uh, uh, this committee, if you like, called Group 14, and uh, a lot of high-profile people on it, not, not me, uh, the other guys. And I, I raised a bit of money. Uh, to tell you the truth, it wasn't a heart because corporate Australia, corporate Sydney, the f people were up in arms about what had happened to that club. It was disgusting what they did, them, tossing them out, you know? I mean, football teams are some people's entire life. That's all they've got, you know? Um, absolutely disgraceful. So great day when uh, the appeal was upheld. Uh, it's announced they're back at the competition. We drank a lot of beer that day. I was in the courtroom when it, when it was announced. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I got involved, raised a few dollars and, and, and just started doing things. And one thing led to another. And I ended up getting the job as uh, the CEO um, at uh, September 28, 2002 it was. So it was at the end of the club's first season back. And, and the club was struggling. You know, it was put back together quickly. Didn't have a Leeds club supporting it like a lot of the others do, including your beloved Broncos. And it was really hard work. And I had to run the club on a, a measly 10 or 11 million a year, which sounds a lot. It is not enough. So um, I was there for about three years. And it was honestly the hardest three years of my life. And I still had the businesses and, and everything else going. I was just working insane hours. Yeah, but it was fun, but very demanding. So yet again, you've done another thing that I can't name one other person that I'm even I've even talked to, met, or anything that used to be a CEO of an NRL team. Mate, they should earn more money, CEOs of NRL teams. Uh, you hear a lot about the coaches, as you should, because they're they're driving the football side of it, if you like. But the CEO is the custodian of the club's finances. The CEO is the person that drives the mandate, as set by the board. You are dealing with players, player agents, players' families, sponsors, a board of management, staff, the media, and it just never ends. Stadium, stadium negotiations, and you are never left alone. And it was not unusual at all for my mobile to ring at midnight uh, with some journalist wanting clarification on some ridiculous rumor he'd heard that day. And then you'd say to that journalist, mate, that's not true not remotely true and he'd still write it anyway the next day like please <laughs> so it, it, it's it's hard work man yeah but they should earn more money <laughs> they're under a lot of pressure i can only talk to you about what i experience and i've done a year of having absolutely no idea what i'm doing with media or anything i've done it because no one else would do it i come back to bikes and i had all these i'm gonna but no one ever did so I spent, with the help of Afterpay, I spent quite a lot of money last year that I didn't have, but I've paid everything off and I've paid on my bills, but managed to travel a little bit. And now I've found, even doing what we're doing right now, I still get texts of people asking me silly things about stuff that make no sense and it's all nonsense. But I guess that's yeah. a sign of doing the right thing. <laughs> it's um, just another example as you'll discover as you go along and become more established, uh, you can, sorry, I just actually, um, I've got a cut on my hand and I just know it's bleeding, sorry. Um, you'll find that, um, you'll find that it's an example of the fact that you can't please all the people all the time. And, you know, people will take pot shots like you on social media and you don't know what you're talking about. And why did you say that for? And you've got no idea and you should give it away. And, you know, don't ever listen to it. Don't ever listen to it. Uh, I've had as much of that as anybody. And you know what? It always comes from people that have not achieved a damn thing in their life. You know, so just remember that. they got nothing better to do. The keyboard commandos, as we used to call them. What is wrong with people to want to be able to commentate under pressure and things like that? Like a normal person to just be happy enough to watch the event, let alone you've done things like Bathurst and road racing that, what's wrong with you that makes you want to operate under such intense pressure? Oh, because it's fun. <laughs> it's, not, it's not intense pressure. If you're passionate and that's what you do or if that's what you want to do, you're focusing on doing the best job you can, coming out the other side and being happy with yourself. 
you know. So um, as long as you prepare properly, you know, and that's what it's all about, you, you've got to prepare correctly and uh, have the knowledge in the back of your mind or on notes or both um, so that you can, you can throw those things in when you need to. It's a bit like what we were talking about before with rugby league commentary, but um, it's fun, mate. Um, I, I never considered it pressure. I considered the only pressure I put on was I put on myself to, to do well. Yeah. Promoting you- Speedway, a different story. The pressure comes from the weather. You can work on something for 18 months and do everything right. A superb marketing program, have the best field of say side cars in the world, have the best marketing program. Everything's in place. Five o'clock, a big black dirty cloud comes over. That's pressure, but that's probably more aligned to stress. Do you know what I mean? And then you start counting what, hang on, I could actually lose a bit here tonight, you know? Um, and you know that before you go into it, but it's just part of the deal. If you lose, you lose. But uh, yeah, I didn't ever find like the Bathurst and those things. I called the Moto GP World Championship for a number of seasons, all three classes uh, for ESPN in Asia. And um, I wasn't even at the track. <laughs> I was in a studio in Sydney calling it off tube, off a TV. And I'd tell people that, even you know, well credential media people, I'd go, man, how that? That's pressure. That was fun. <laughs> that was a super challenge. You know, I had to go to a lot of trouble to find out the weather at uh, Barcelona in Spain before you went on there. We did, I never said I was there, but I didn't say I wasn't. Do you know what I mean? So that was a, that was a challenge. That was during the Wayne Gardner, Wayne Rainey, Kevin Swanson, McDoon era. Good, good racing. Great characters. Yeah, you don't have to tell me twice. I was a motorsport freak when I was a kid. My father was mad on motorsport. He um, would watch everything, anything with wheels, and then same with the football, anything to do with rugby league. So it's funny or it's interesting that you had the same crossover where it was motorsport and rugby league as well. Yeah, it was well for me. It was a perfect balance because I got that way. I could, uh, um, I could guarantee myself uh, income all year. You know, you, you sort of uh, do rugby league in the winter and, and do motorsport in the summer. You do motorsport in the winter too when you weren't doing football. You know, there's seven days in the week, <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, that's. That. But I just was passionate about all of it. You know, um, otherwise I wouldn't have, you know, worked like a lunatic for I want to talk about um, some of the characters over the years you've met in. Um, I suppose we'll focus on Speedway as well but uh, motorsport in general, but say in your time of being in speedway bikes and sidecars, who were the, some of the absolute standout personalities, whether it be people are weird, people are funny as hell, um, excellent traits of people. Yeah. yeah from, um, uh, from the point of view of solos, firstly of the internationals, uh, though I had a lot to do with Simon Wick was one of the, the greatest characters, had a beaming smile, uh, had that Cockney English sort of humour as well. Uh, Rick, Tony Ricardson was a really funny guy. He liked to have a good time. I, I always admired him. He, he had a balance in his life when he was the king of the world, six world championships, and he revolutionised the sport. His, his presentation, his motorhomes, he, the way he'd put up huge marquees and feed all his sponsors, and he, he did it right. You're talking about a guy that in Sweden was voted Sweden's most popular personality. Like he was God there. But he still knew how to have fun. He really was a, a funny guy. So Wigan and, uh, and obviously Ricardson, uh, the Aussie Steve Johnson, without a doubt, uh, the funniest, the funniest, absolute larrikin. Um, he wasn't on the tour of the first two years because he wasn't really that established then. But he joined in 1997, and everyone said, "Mate, please sign him for life." You know, he's got to be on the road with us. He was, he was, um, he was a stress release for a lot of people, John. Um, of the other Aussies. Um, Craig Boyce was a funny guy in his own own way. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of them are quite serious. You know, what they've got to do is is pretty intense, and um, but they they can still have a good time away from the track. Now, Billy Hammer was a, a funny guy too, the American you mentioned him before. Yeah, uh, in general motorsport, funny guys. Dick Johnson loved him, funny as you know that. Yeah, really good guy and so professional, so cooperative with the media. Uh, couldn't he just never said no to any request from me, radio, TV, anything? Um, the guy that I worked with in road racing that, 
that absolutely blew me away was Peter Brock. See, you mentioned uh, that I was lucky enough to call Bathurst uh, earlier, and he was my co-commentator. He'd just retired. Uh, I couldn't believe I was sitting in a broadcast box at Mount Panorama with the King. And, mate, he is the, was the nicest guy. He was funny. He had all his quotes and, and, and one-liners, and there was, all, there was a message behind so much of what he said, some of which I took on board. Let me tell you the secret for life inside, Jack. Bite off more than you can chew and chew like bloody buggery. You know? <laughs> and that epitomised him. Uh, but it, that was just an, an amazing experience to share the broadcast box with him that that, you know, that weekend. And um, Bradley Jones was also there too. He's a great guy. Uh, but yeah, the, the road racing guys, most of them are incredibly affable, charismatic, extroverted. Overall, they're infinitely more professional as a group than, than speedway cars. Yeah, to be honest, they kind of get it, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. Um, do you want me to talk about speedway cars? Oh, you can if well, you want. I, I've left I, that world behind. I, I always, a lot of a lot of great people. Uh, I, Max Dumsney was really funny, you know. And I became good friends with Max. We we went out a lot. Uh, well, not a lot, but we went out. Reg, you know, a few times a year we'd have a beer or whatever. Funny guy. Um, I always enjoyed Brooke Tatton's company. He was quite quirky and, you know, he was a typical Tatnall, I suppose. Plenty of charisma. But you know, a lot of great people overall. In the sidecars, um, the question was who was funny. Um, I used to laugh at Glenn O'Brien. He used to <laughs> say some really funny things. I have yeah. massive respect for him. I, I actually saw your interview with him on, online recently. It was really good. Um, Andrew Cleave was a pleasure to be around, not just a professional guy and a great writer. But he, he didn't know how funny he was. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, you mentioned a bloke before, Paul Cohen. Mate. There is no one funnier in the world in any sport, you know? So, look, I could go on for hours about that stuff. And I could listen to you for hours, but you did touch on a couple of people. So, like I said, I was the motorsport fan growing up. So, it'd be go to the Echo Saturday night, go to Lakeside Sunday and watch the touring cars. And my Brock story, because everyone's got one, I was the asthma kid, so they would always have to try and um, find me a PowerPoint to use my asthma machine. Brocky's car was going out to the grid, and he's still hanging out with me, making sure my asthma machine's working, and they're dragging him away by the suit, saying, you have to get in the car and race, and he goes, oh, we'll get there. And everyone else's cars are started. They're doing all that. Dickie's in his car and everything. Brocky's like, you're right, mate? Yep, yeah, all good. Okay, well, I'll go out now. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. That was a great era, wasn't it? You know, it was a, an era that'll never be repeated the sport. There was that traditional Ford Holden thing, of course. Um, but all the drivers were household names and a lot of them were characters. I mean, Larry Perkins was a funny guy. Alan Grice was very opinionated. You know, that era was was really good. Enjoyed it immensely. Now, that was also an era in the earlier stages where they were doing awesome things like and I don't care about um, whether this is uh, woke culture or saying the right thing, but tobacco sponsorship, when I was a kid, it was the Winfield Cup Rugby League and then it was Winfield Drag Racing, Motorsport, you name it. How crazy was the money back then with the tobacco sponsorship? Well, obviously, that was because prior to that, the government had based in the fact that tobacco companies couldn't advertise in mainstream media, uh, television and radio predominantly. They can still do magazines for a while, but then that got noticed out too. And uh, Motorsport was sort of the last entity standing, if you like. And yeah, they threw a lot of money at it, you know. And you know how you, you know how you know they did because none of those teams or drivers are around anymore. Think about it. Fred Gibson, Winfield Motorsport, gone. Uh, Tony Longhurst, Benson, it is BMW, gone. Glenn Seaton, Peter Jackson, gone. And so it goes on. So they were putting an insane amount of money in the sport um, because it was the only place they could put it. And if you looked on a global scale, you know, there was the, the McLaren team, uh, there was uh, in MotoGP, every leading contender was sponsored by a tobacco company. You know, um, things have changed a lot. And, and no one will ever convince me 
that going to Eastern Creek Raceway and seeing a superbike thunder mount down the main straight with a tobacco brand on it would make someone go and take up smoke. Come on. <laughs> but they have to be seen to be politically correct, don't they? You're 100% right. And I've actually talked about this at great length with a lot of people that aren't even into motorsport. When I was a little boy, I had Winfield posters everywhere. And fun fact, I'm going to pick up on Saturday a huge wall-mounted Winfield digital clock. It's a helmet. Um, I'm getting that given to oh, me. Man. Yep. I'm not yep. even a smoker, and I still can't wait to put that on my wall. So, no, they didn't sell me on cigarettes. No, no not at all. But it was uh, it was uh, political correct pressure, wasn't it? You know, just the way it goes. And we've not seen uh, any greater example than p political correctness in this COVID nonsense, but let's not start on that. Because I will not stop talking. <laughs> yeah, I've got a mate at work that's pretty keen on that. I am so in my own little world that I don't care. But anyway, moving on from that, can you explain to people that um, the days are gone of someone with a massive fistful of cash that goes, you just put your sticker on your car and I'll sponsor you to no end. Explain Absolutely. to people how sponsorship in that nowadays is actually supposed to work well it's not how it's supposed to work it's how it does work you know you're you are 100 percent right you've nailed it uh, there was an era uh if we talk about the sport that obviously you represent speedway and, and a sport that i was involved in for a, a lifetime um there was an era when you could get money off someone for a sticker on the car um but the world has changed so much the first thing that they want to know is is it on television the second thing they want to know is what database have you got? The third thing they want to know is what corporate functions can we go to and network with other prospective people that we can do business with? Sadly, I don't need to, what one of those three is Australian Speedway got. You know, most venues don't even have a media centre. The media can't even be bothered going. There's no way for them to stand. <laughs> you know, so... At the end of the day, it's all about value for money. Like they want databases so that they can access those people. I mean, in the case of the telecommunications companies, that's the first thing they ask. What sort of database have you got we can get access to? You know, and, and it's a myriad of things. It's not about having a sticker on a bike or a car and a sign over on turn one. It's just not about that. They can do far better spending a few bucks on Facebook or YouTube. It's about the experiences, you know, the, the ride days and access to data and corporate functions and who can they network with. Them. That's, you know, at the South Sydney Rabbitohs, 20 years ago, we had a, a concept called the Chairman's Club, which had a, a, a capacity of 500 people. We were not winning football games. We were sold out in that corporate lounge every single home game because it was an opportunity for the owner of that business to talk to the owner of that business. That business over there might be the local car dealer. They might sell nine cars to this guy over here who owns a large business, you know, two Ks away, whatever. So we, we had 500 people in there, three course meal, hosted, MC, guest speakers. And I used to put a celebrity on every table. So they were tables of 10. Uh, so if you bought a table, you, that would be nine. And you would have Ray Martin sitting at your table or Andrew Denton or the injured Rabbitohs captain, uh, or Don Lane, the late, great Don Lane, or Alan Jones. Uh, and so it goes on. Um, that's what they want. That's what they want, you know, uh, in addition to the other things I mentioned. Um, it was sort of very evident to me, even in that era, even in rugby league, that the world has completely gone past all that old stuff, where... You could get five grand off someone for painting your logo on, on your door of your sedan or your four covers of your bike. And unfortunately, Australian Speedway doesn't get that. Even at a very low, low level that I'm at now, I'm finding it very difficult with certain groups to even get them to share on social media and stuff. And you did touch on something with networking that, I've worked for people that that's why they join golf clubs is so they can network with other people. And I think even at a lower, lower level, if we all help each other, it's got to be good for everyone. Yes, of course it is. Yeah. 
Um, you nailed it, mate. You nailed it. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could sort of wax lyrical about that stuff, but Australian Speedway has never had a media guide. Every mainstream sport has a media guide that is posted out free to journalists, irrespective of who they are, that's glossy, that's colourful, that has all the contacts for every track, has the calendar for every track, has the pinnacle events, has the specifications, um, uh, has maps of how you get to the media centre when you arrive at the track and what facilities there are, you know, faxes or HDMI cables or Wi-Fi. A sports never had one. We could sit here for hours and hours talking and I'm definitely going to be someone talking to you off camera in the future for trying to do what I can do better. But um, in a perfect world of you doing what you did back then and that now, I don't see that being replicated. But one thing I really enjoy is the weird little sports or weird to me that you're covering now that's really cool. So what's something you cover right now that that really um, people wouldn't know that you're covering? Oh, well, look, our business has been very, very seriously impacted by COVID. You know, Sport Copper Caney had got shut down. Uh, our revenue has fallen by millions. Uh, we're still in business, though, and I'm really happy about that. Um, primarily, we do horse racing nearly every day of the week. We facilitate live horse racing coverage. Uh, we have a contract at about seven venues, so I have a crew at an event tonight. Uh, which I'll be in touch with when I, when I finish with you. Uh, and that's very demanding, very exacting. It's live all the time. So there's absolutely no room for error. Got a lot of gear and a lot of people across the country. I use about 40 people a week, staff and crew. Um, and, and it's kept us in business. I'm very grateful for that. Um, uh, but we've got we've got some other things coming up too, but I, I won't say yet because the contract's not signed. But we, are, we, we'll, we have always been involved in a myriad of sports. But sadly, a lot of that has fallen by the wayside, but I am seeing signs of it starting to, to return. Just to quickly sign all this off, I just want to say thank you for impacting my life, which is a really selfish thing to say. But as you can see, I'm a rolled up comic book of Speedway tattoos. And um, you, you've done a lot that's impacted my life directly. And there's a huge hole in Australian motorsport, let alone Speedway, because you're not there. But uh, thank you for everything. Oh, come on, Archer. You're too kind. And uh, mate, you're the man to take it in the future. So you're doing a great job. Happy to join you again anytime. I've really enjoyed the chat. I don't talk Speedway that much these days. Uh, it's just not part of my life now. Uh, and I don't dwell on it either. I had a, a good run and I gave it everything for a long time. Um, the sport's got a lot of problems and um, we'll see where it goes from here. You know, it's uh, lacks leadership lacks direction, has no marketing plan, has no business plan. Undoubtedly, COVID has really impacted on Speedway too. But um, mate, I'm sure that someone will come along and, uh, and replicate what we did. The saddest thing for me is there's no TV coverage. You know, we spent a lot of time, a lot of years uh, making that happen in numerous categories, uh, in numerous countries. Uh, and to me, it's, it's taken a quantum leap backwards in that regard. Some of the live streaming I've seen is it just doesn't cut it. So I hope that can turn around in the future anyway. All right, mate. Well, thanks for the chat, and I will definitely be looking forward to another one in the future. Good on you, Dave. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Nah, we'll talk soon.